Hi Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Liu, welcome back to my channel. This week we saw ESA's Solar Orbiter mission release some stunning high resolution imaging of the Sun. The images were taken on March 26, 2022, on its first close pass to the Sun since its launch in 2020. And whilst the spacecraft braved extreme temperatures and solar flares to bring us these 10 times higher resolution than your 4K TV, in this week's video, I don't want to talk about Solar Orbiter, but instead I want to revisit the mystery that had scientists puzzled from the 1960s up until when it was solved not so long ago. The mystery is what makes the sun shine? So let's get on with it. In the early 20th century, it was believed that the sun generates its energy by converting hydrogen nuclei into helium through a process known as nuclear fusion. In its core, the sun fuses 500 billion kilograms of hydrogen every second. According to this theory, four hydrogen nuclei or protons would be turned into a helium nucleus. Two positrons, which are positively charged electrons, and two neutrinos, specifically electron neutrinos. The process would also release energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation and kinetic energy carried by those charged particles, the positrons and the neutrinos. Electromagnetic radiation is the energy that travels to the Earth as sunlight. The positron doesn't last very long. There's just too many electrons everywhere, and when a positron meets an electron, they annihilate each other and produce gamma ray radiation. Neutrinos, on the other hand, are able to travel freely from the sun's core all the way to Earth. In the 1960s, Ray Davis and John Bakel led an experiment to collect and count neutrinos emitted by nuclear fusion taking place in the sun. Their experiment was a 380 cubic meter tank, that's about the size of a swimming pool, and they filled it with perchloroethylene, which is the same fluid that is used in dry cleaning. They put the tank in a gold mine 1,500 meters underground so that it wasn't affected by interference from things like cosmic rays. Now, perchloroethylene, as its name suggests, contains chlorine. And when an electron neutrino meets chlorine, it turns into radioactive argon. The scientists used a detailed computer model of the sun to estimate how many neutrinos they expected from the sun and how many argon atoms would be produced by these solar neutrinos in the tank. They were the first to measure a shortage of argon and hence neutrinos from the sun. They detected only about one third as many radioactive argon atoms as were predicted. At first, people thought that this had to be a mistake, that the calculations were wrong or that the experiment was wrong. But the calculations were checked and there was nothing wrong with them. And multiple different experiments after this one found exactly the same deficiency of neutrinos. Perhaps the theory of what makes the sun shine is wrong. The missing solar neutrino problem wasn't solved until 2001. Now, neutrinos made in the sun are only electron neutrinos, but other types of neutrinos are also known to exist. The muon neutrino and tau neutrino have been made in particle accelerators or in supernovae explosions. But all the experiments that looked at this problem before were only sensitive to electron neutrinos. That is, until the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, SNO for short, came online. SNO was a detector that used heavy water as its detector. This detector is sensitive to all of the neutrino flavors. In 2001, the scientists at SNO confirmed that their measurement showed that the total of neutrinos of all types was consistent with what we expected from the number of neutrinos produced in the interior of the sun. This means that the electron neutrinos that were produced by the sun had morphed into muon and tauon neutrinos by the time that they had traveled to Earth. 
This quantum phenomenon is known as neutrino oscillation. And actually, SNO wasn't the first to measure it. It had been measured by Super Kamiokande experiment in 1998, albeit the results were inconclusive back then. The findings had other implications too. Previously, neutrinos were believed to be massless, but the fact that neutrinos can transmute into one another implies that at least two of the neutrinos must have a mass. The standard model of particle physics is wrong. Now the game is on to measure the masses of those neutrinos. In 2015, Arthur MacDonald from SNO and Takaki Kahita from the Super Kamiokande experiment won the Nobel Prize for their work on neutrino oscillation. That's all for this week's video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe.